think it's inappropriate to stand for somebody before they speak. Because <laughs> now you've said that I have to do well. Um, I appreciate JC and all of his remarks about me. I also fully recognize that Father's Day is the least attended Sunday every year. And so he brought me to speak to you on the Sunday. He knew there would be fewer people here. <laughs> so he, he said the fewer people I can influence, the better. Um, hey, I think there's a picture of my family on the screen here in just a moment. So um, we have the five daughters, Cassie, Kelsey, Kenzie, Kayla, and Carly. And that's why I look like this. But uh, also now the four sons and the 11 grandchildren and two more on the way. I may have mentioned to you before that Rhonda's been praying for my healing I'm about 75% deaf, so I wear hearing devices. We have 11 grandchildren with two on the way. I'm good. Um, <laughs> healing is not at the top of my list at the moment. Um, my hearing aids have the mute option. They're Bluetooth connected to my phone. I have the mute option. And so periodically, Rhonda and I will be riding down a road with some of our grandchildren, and I'll see her waving at me, and I'll turn and look at her, and she'll go, unmute me right now. <laughs> All right. And some of you men in the room wish you were me. I know, you wish you could mute. I, I'm just saying. I'm pretty sure Holy Spirit looks at all of us every now and then and says, how about unmuting me, right? I want to talk to you for a few moments this morning on a simple little subject of doing hard things for the right reasons. Doing hard things for the right reasons. As we start our conversation here today on Father's Day, I want to give honor to my own father. I um, lost my dad about seven years ago. In, it was seven years ago in May. Wonderful man of God. He grew up in an abusive alcoholic home, and as soon as he could, he quit school in the 10th grade, left, and went to the military, and I was there for a while. When he came out, he stopped in a little church of God in Conklin Town, West Virginia, where he accepted Jesus, filled with the Spirit, and called to preach, and for the next 60 years of his life, he just gave his life fully into the kingdom, investing in people, and bringing people into our home, and doing mission trips all over the world, much of who we are today is a direct result of the influence of my dad in my life, and, and losing him, as, I, as all of you who have lost your parents know, it's a difficult journey. But I will say this, for those of us that are fathers, make sure you take care of your children, because one day they might have to take care of you, right? And if you've sown a good, uh, if you've sown good seed, maybe it'll come back. My dad, uh, when he was 80 years old, this past February, so it was seven years ago, he was 80 years old, and in relatively good health, a little bit of arthritis, but for the most part, good health, and his shoulder started to give him a lot of struggle and difficulty, and so he went to the doctor, they sent him to Vanderbilt, and overnight we went from relatively good health with arthritis to bone cancer, brain cancer, abdominal cancer, and, uh, and they told us we had about 18 months for him to live. And he actually only survived about three months. And during those three months, my little sister moved in with him to care for him and help take care of my mom who had Alzheimer's. And uh, my brothers, Jeff and Keith and I, would rotate through to spend time with dad during those last three months of his life. And uh, over the course of time, the brain cancer stopped sending the signal to his legs, so he got to where he, was, he could no longer walk. So he slept in his recliner in the living room, and so when I was there and he needed to go somewhere, I would pick him up and carry him. So I'd carry him to the kitchen table for breakfast or lunch or dinner. I'd carry him to the bathroom when he'd go there, carry him back to his chair. So when I was there, I carried him around. So uh, one Saturday evening, my brother Jeff was there, my sister, and I was there, and I said, hey, Dad, I got to drive back to Atlanta and preach tomorrow. I said, I'll be back tomorrow afternoon. He goes, that's fine, son. So I left. I came to Atlanta. I spoke that morning. That afternoon, I drove back, and when I got back to my dad's house, uh, Jeff and April, my brother and sister, had him out on the front porch. He was in his wheelchair. They had rolled him out, and it was a beautiful day. Sun was shining. Birds were singing, and it was one week before he passed away the following Sunday, and so I walked up on the porch, and when I walked up, dad goes, man, I am so glad you're back, and I said, well, of course you are. I'm your favorite child. Of course you're glad I'm back, and he goes, no, no, no. I'm glad you're back because you're strong enough to carry me. These two have been dragging me all over the house. <laughs> right? So you just want to make sure so into your children because they might have to carry you somewhere down the road, right? And so when we think about doing hard things for the right reasons, obviously it's Father's Day. Our sermon is primarily directed at dads. But for me, it's also directed to everybody that follows Jesus because we all have responsibility to sow into the next generation and the generation after that. So whether we're a father, a mother, a grandfather, grandmother, aunt, uncle, whatever the case may be, the message is for all of us this morning along the way. I, I decided a long time ago in my life that the three most important things in my life were, number one, being a son of the Most High, 
right? It's the most important role any of us will ever play, that we are children of God and that we represent him well in the earth. That should be my number one priority. My number two priority in life is to be a great husband to my wife, Rhonda. As JC mentioned, we've been married 37 years now. There are people who describe her as the color in my black and white rainbow, right? And so I'm just this black and white, let's go get stuff done, boom, boom, boom. I need a gallon of milk. I go to the store, I get a gallon of milk. I go to self-checkout so I don't have to talk to anybody and I go home. My wife needs a gallon of milk. She goes to the store. She talks to everybody on each aisle between the front of the store and the milk comes home and tells me about the cashier's children, grandchildren. In fact, she was in the hospital last week, got her hair done the week before that, and had a flat tire on her tire on, on the way to work. And I'm like, huh, why? So anyway, it, it's just a wonderful experience to have her because when I travel and speak, like I mentioned, I can't hear very well. I travel and speak in a lot of places people want to line up and talk to me, and I don't particularly care for that. So I just stand her in front of me. It's just a wonderful thing that God does in our life periodically. That's my second most important role. My third most important role is father to my five daughters. And then also father influence in the boy, into the young men that they've married and into the grandchildren, right, by extension. Those are my number four in my life is running places like City of Refuge and chairman of the board for House of Cheer at their survival program and most. And if I ever let those things move above my children, my wife, or my sonship, then things are out of order and it's not going to go the way it's supposed to be. So our number one priority is to serve him, amen? amen? Our number two priority is to be the great spouse to the one God has given us and then number three, to sow into our children's life along the way. Psalm 127, verses three and four, many of you can quote, children are a heritage from the Lord, a reward from him. They are like arrows in our hands, arrows, arrows that we get to send into the world and it's a blessing to have many children. I'd like, to, if I'd like to issue three opportunities, three challenges to us this morning based on three very familiar verses of Scripture. And as I said, these opportunities are available to all of us. The first opportunity I'd like to talk about is the opportunity to instruct. We're the teacher. You're the teacher. Dads, we're the teachers. We should be teaching our children the ways of the, well, of the Lord, the words of the Lord, the characteristics of the Lord. We should not leave it up to someone else to teach our children about God. We should be the ones teaching our children about God. I'm really excited that a bunch of my grandchildren are down in Go Kids right now, and I appreciate what they do in Go Church but, and Go Kids, but what they do in Go Kids should be supplementing what my daughters and sons-in-law are sowing into their children's life. It should not take the place. We are the teachers. We should be instilling the Word of God into them. Psalm 22, 6, train up a child. Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it, Right? So a better translation here, sometimes folks who have their sons and daughters have become wayward. They have moved away from their relationship with God. They're outside of the will of God. Those men and women will come to me for counsel. They'll say, Pastor, but I trained them up in the way they should go. I, I did what I was supposed to do. This, I sowed truth into them, and now it seems like God has abandoned me because they're not following him. But a more literal translation, when you dive into the linguistic linguistical treatment of this verse of scripture and do word study what it actually says, train up a child in the way he or she should go. And when they are old, it will not depart from them. You see, if we put truth in our sons and daughters lives, it will always be in them. They can go where they want to go. They can do what they want to do. They can make whatever decision they want to make. But if we have put the word of God in them, the word of God will always remain in them. No matter where they travel, no matter how they try to rebel, no matter how they try to reject the Word of God, if we have placed it in them, it's going to remain in them. And I believe at some point in time, that truth, that Word of God that we have placed in them is going to woo them back to the cross of Jesus Christ and woo them back to a relationship. But if we have not been the teachers and we have not taught them the way of the Lord and they choose to walk away, then there is no truth in them that invites them back. And so this morning, we have to be teachers. We have to be the one that sows into them because if we choose not to be the teacher, someone else is going to be the teacher, right? 
So society is going to be the teacher. IG is going to be the teacher. TikTok is going to be the teacher. Music, entertainment, kids coming from non-Christian homes. Somebody's going to teach our kids about morality. Somebody's going to teach our kids about a value system. Somebody's going to teach our kids what's right and wrong. And if we have not done it from the word of God, then they're going to accept a truth that is actually a lie. And I don't want to be a part of my kids accepting anything that does not align with the Word of God. So I bear that responsibility in my heart and in my life and in my journey with them. Ron and I decided to be teachers of God's Word and His ways early in their kids' lives. At very early ages, on the swing, Rhonda would be pushing our girls, and they would be quoting Psalm 23, and they would be quoting the Lord's Prayer, right? That doesn't mean they've lived every single day of their life according to those verses of Scripture, but we decided early on that was going to be the most important thing that we put into their life. And we are blessed now by the fact that all five of them choose to serve Jesus and live according to his words and his ways. And we think that part of that is because we started the moment they were born. Before they were born, I was speaking blessings over their life. From the time they were born, we were speaking blessings and speaking God's word and singing scripture over them. Well, I wasn't singing over them. Rhonda was singing over them. If I'd have sung over them, they'd have rejected all the things of the Lord. I can assure you that. Rhonda's singing over them. And they live out the way they're supposed to now. Now, sometimes, you you see, when we move into Scripture and instruction and teaching, sometimes you have to be careful because your children will take what you have taught them and they will use it against you. You ever had that happen? You, You teach your children something and then they use it against you. Now, Pastor JC has mentioned several times when I've been in service here that when he uses one of his children in a sermon illustration, he has to give them $5. Well, if that's the case today, I'll be broke when this sermon is over because I'm going to talk about my children, right? So we sowed into them the fact that God loves you. He's a God of grace and mercy and justice, and he will always give you another chance. He will always give you another chance, right? And so I came home from work one day, and we had four girls at the time. They were seven, five, three, and one. I came home, and, and Rhonda said, would you go look in the laundry room? So I went and looked in the laundry room, and, and my toolbox was open in the laundry room, and, and the sheetrock knife was laying out to the side, and there was sheetrock dust on the floor. And in the wall of the laundry room, there was a, a square had been carved out with my sheetrock knife by one of the daughters. And I didn't have to really try to think about which one of them might have done that, because the oldest redhead was old enough to do that and had the gumption, so I just yelled, Kelsey, come in here. So she comes in the laundry room, and I looked at her, and I said, "Uh, what is this right here? And she goes, well, that's your toolbox. And I said, who brought it in here? She goes, I did. Then I said, what's that right there? She goes, it's your knife. And I go, it is. I said, who got that out? She said, I did. I said, what's that right there? She said, it's a hole in the wall. And I said, well, who cut the hole in the wall? She goes, I did. And I looked at her and I said, are you supposed to be messing with my tools? No, sir. Are you supposed to get a knife out? No, sir. Are you supposed to carve a box in the wall? No, sir. And I said, well, then why did you do that? She goes, I don't know. I go, no, really, why? She goes, I I, I don't know, Dad. And I said, well, what do you think I should do? She put her head down. She goes, I don't know. And I go, no, real. What, what, what should I do? You know you weren't supposed to do this, right? Yes, sir. Well, then what should I do? I don't know. I don't know. And then I said to her, okay, let's do it this way. If you were the dad and I was the daughter and I got your tools and I carved a hole in the wall, what would you do? She put her head down. She looked up and she goes, I'd spank you. She said, or I'd give you one more chance. (laughs) So she took the word of the Lord that he will always forgive you and give you one more chance to work against me. Do you think she got a spanking or not? Of course not. She got one more chance, right? When we sow into our kids, sometimes they'll use it against us. Hopefully they use it for kingdom purposes. Sometimes they'll use it against us. We taught our kids a scripture about Listen, you have to become like a little child to enter the kingdom of heaven. You have to be like children. You have to be like a child. Live your life like a child. 
So I came downstairs one morning. Carly was about six years old, getting ready for first grade of school. And I came down the steps. It's early in the morning. I'm sort of still half asleep. And she's gotten six or eight or 10 pots and pans and placed them face down, flipped them upside down on the kitchen counter. She's got big metal spoons out from under the uh, stove. And she is playing the drums at seven o'clock in the morning at an unbelievable amount of volume. And I'm like, good Lord, be quiet. And she looks at me and smiles. Blah, 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 blah. I'm like, Carly, be quiet. Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, Carly. And she looked at me and she goes, you just need to learn to live like a child again. <laughs> right? I have to rebuke my children from the words I've taught them along the way. By the way, if, if, you have, if you seem to have trouble getting things that you want from God, Pastor David talked about, you know, just asking for what you want, but if you can't seem to get it, sometimes if you identify somebody else in your life that's a real prayer warrior, you may want them to ask for you, right? So Rhonda had four little girls in six years, so we had Cassie, Kelsey, Kenzie, Car uh, Kaylin, four in six years, and then we waited six years, and Rhonda said, I believe there's another little package waiting on us somewhere, and then we had Carly six years after the youngest. And so when we had Carly, Rhonda would take her out on the swing on the, on the porch in our house and she would rock Carly for long periods of time because she was this little one six years after the other. And Rhonda would go, this is my treasure. This is our little treasure. This is our treasure. And so as Carly began to get older, she began to ask me for things because there's this six-year gap. She would sort of get things and the other girls got jealous of that. And so they just got to the point where they were like, if you want something, tell treasure to ask daddy treasure will get it treasure will get the prize and so they all just went through treasure to get what they wanted in life right sometimes you got to go through somebody it's a better prayer warrior than you are along the way so the first thing we need the opportunity is to instruct you're the teacher the second thing is the opportunity to instill you're the coach right as dads, we're the coach. We should be coaching our kids, not just telling them how to live, but teaching them how to live. And the way we teach them how to live is by showing them how to live along the way. So we coach them. So I had the opportunity. I played ball through school, enjoyed it, lo loved the atmosphere, loved the camaraderie and the friendship. And we would often go, when, no matter what sport I was playing, we'd go into the classroom first and we would study film. So the coaches would show us on film the plays. They would show us what they want us to do. They would call us out if we had done something wrong. They would identify the weaknesses in the opponent. And so we'd see it on the screen. And if we'd only seen it on the screen, we still would not have been as successful as we needed to be because we then had to go to the field and put it into practice. And in the, on the field, in practice, the coach would literally sometimes come and put his hands on me and show me you need to be in this position. You need to have your body turned this way. Why did you turn here? And so they coached me along the way. And with our kids, we need to be willing to be the coaches, dads, and everybody else that has influence. Not just a teacher that looks at our children and says, do this, do this, do this. But we need to be willing to get in the dirt with them and teach them how to live a life according to God's plan and will for them. Being absent from their life is going to separate us from influence in their life. And so we need to figure out how we adjust our schedules, our times, our places together in order to be able to instill in them. You know the passage of Scripture in Deuteronomy says, The Lord our God, He is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your strength. And then he says this, These commandments I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children instill them into your children. Make sure your kids get them. Talk about them when you sit down at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them to your foreheads. The Christ life is not just the words that we use to teach. It's the way we live, the way we handle conflict, the approach we take to those less fortunate, the way we worship, the way we give of ourselves. And so it's not just this moment at the end of the day or periodically when we sit down with our kids and open scripture and talk about it, but the Christ life where we get to instruct is when we sit at home, when we're in the car, at the park, out to dinner, that we choose to talk about the ways of the Lord, reflect the nature of Christ, challenge sin, and celebrate holiness. We want to let our kids see the Jesus that we have taught them, uh, taught them about revealed in us, right? Nothing worse than, that, than for us to contradict Scripture with the way we live. 
So we say to our kids, this is the model of the Christ life, and yet they see us respond in a, in a contentious situation in a way that does not represent Christ. We don't want that to happen. We want to instruct them, and we want to instill in them what the word of the Lord is. Now, one of the things that I chose to instill in my kids was what's right and what's wrong, and that there are consequences when things don't go the way that they should go, right? There's reward when we do whatever we see the word of the Lord tell us to do, but there are also consequences, and the same's true in the parent-child relationship. And so my kids have been good kids. We've had a few moments here and there. And so uh, when Kenzie was, I think, a junior in high school, she decided to have a little bit of a quote-unquote rebellious nature about her. Her husband Garrison's nodding his head and raising his head because it was before him, and she was hanging out with a couple guys that did not gain my approval or his approval, and he was in love with her and just hadn't told her yet, right? And so Kenzie's hanging out with some people that we didn't care for. Now, when guys came to my house to see my daughters, and that happened awful with five daughters, we'd have guys show up the first time they would show up. We would let them be in the house for a little while, then I would look at them and say, let me see you on the back porch, right? And the girls would all go, ah. Oh. So I'd take the guys to the back porch, and it was a short conversation. I would just simply say, if you ever hurt my daughter in any way, I'll kill you. Do you have any questions, right? <laughs> but generally a short conversation, and they generally didn't show back up. And so it worked out pretty well for me, right? And then we finally got the ones that do. So but anyway, so, so Kenzie was having this little moment in her life, right? And I always told my girls, they, they make fun now because anytime I knew they had done something wrong, they would say, well, how did you find out? And I would say, Holy Spirit told me. And so as far as they knew, Holy Spirit and I were on this conversational relationship and he was just waking me up, telling me, and, and I let them believe that. So anyway, so homecoming dance was taking place and it was at the school where they went. It was in the gym. And I had a sense in my spirit that Kenzie was not at the homecoming dance where she was supposed to be. And so being the kind, generous, sweet father I am, I went to the homecoming dance, right? And it's a little weird for one of the dads to show up where all the juniors and seniors are having a homecoming dance, but I walked around the gym and could not identify that my daughter was in attendance. So I called a couple of her friends to the side, looked at them very sternly and said, where is my daughter? And they told me. And so I got in the car and drove to where she was. She was at a house where several of the students had left and gone to have their own homecoming party. And so as I was driving down the road, there was a, a section of woods between the road and the backyard, but I could see them all. They had a big bonfire going. They're hanging out, having a good time. And it didn't look like it was terrible, but she's still not where she's supposed to be. I've instilled in her what truth is and that she's supposed to be where she says she was. So I parked my car, got out, and walked through the woods. And I got through the woods and I got to a tree just before the edge of the yard and stood behind the tree and I called her on her cell phone that I paid for, by the way. And so I called her on her cell phone and I said, I am currently standing behind a tree at the edge of the yard looking at you. You have a decision to make. You can either look at your friends and say, friends and say I have to go now or I will join your party. And we hung up, and I saw her look around, and she went, I have to go now. <laughs> See you all later. It's been fun, right? I instilled the truth. She chose not to live in truth in the moment, so there was a consequence. If we will instill in our kids the truth, they will recognize when they are in environments that are not appropriate for them, right? And Holy Spirit will show up sometimes in the form of dad, and say, hey, you can either leave or there are consequences coming, right? So Kayla's not here this morning. She's our fourth daughter, she and her husband, and, and their boys are up in Michigan visiting his grandmother who's ill. But when Kayla, Kayla was, again, a good kid, but about her junior year, she decided that she was gonna take a little venture down a different path. And so she was leaving on a mission trip, a mission trip the next morning. She's going on a mission trip to do ministry to people in a third world country. And the night before the mission trip, she decides to sneak out of the house, right, from the second floor because the bottom floor has an alarm system and all the windows have sensors. The upstairs windows don't have sensors. So she ties sheets together, right, like just out of a movie, ties them to the bathroom doorknob and climbs down. Now listen to this. This is how rebellious she was to go meet a boy at the Waffle House. 
I mean, if you're going to rebel, you're scattered, covered, smothered. I mean, whatever it is, right? So she climbs down the side of the house. She had a friend spending the night with her, and it's sort of the plan went a little haywire because her friend was a little heavier than her, and when she climbed down the side of the house, the doorknob broke off, and she fell to the ground. So we know she's at the wall. We figure all this out, but we don't say anything to her. The next morning, 5 o'clock in the morning, we have to go to Atlanta airport. I load her up. I take her to the airport. There's a broken doorknob on the bathroom door, right? There's scrapes down the side of the house. We know. I don't say anything. I just hope you have a great trip, darling. Blah, blah. We get there. All the kids are milling around. There's about 50 of them. And then the leader of the group says, hey, we're all going to gather over here. Tell your parents goodbye. We're going to gather over here. We're going to have prayer, and we're going to go through security. And Kaylin comes running to me, and she falls, drops her head on my shoulder, and she starts crying. She goes, I got to tell you something, Daddy. I already knew, but she goes, I got to tell you something. I snuck out last night, went to the Waffle House, and if I die on this mission trip, I want you to forgive me before I go. <laughs> and I'm like, guilt drove her to repentance because we had instilled in her that it's wrong. And in this moment before she's going to part on this trip, she decides to confess, right? And so we have to instruct well, we get to instruct, we get to instill, and thirdly, we get to inspire. There's an opportunity to inspire our kids. Man, I believe our kids want us to rise up and be what we were created to be. And I believe that's our little kids all the way to our adult kids. Pat, Ryan and I were sitting over here, and David and his wife were sitting here with their little boy, and during worship, it's little, how old is he? One. It's little dude, when worship, it's little dude's got both hands raised up in the air. I mean, I'm telling you, if you didn't know, you would believe that he heard every word and was worshiping the Lord. It was the coolest thing. Well, guess what? They're showing him that. They're inspiring him. They're bringing him into a worship environment where the word of the Lord is being sang and where people are lifting their hands and lifting their voices and their little kid is now raising his hands to Jesus. You know what I believe, David? I believe all the days of his life, he will raise his hands and bless the Lord God Almighty because you've established a foundation. Now, again, don't let your kids think they ruled the church. We were living in a church. And most of y'all have heard that story. We lived in a church in a hood six years and all kind of crazy stuff. And when Kaylin was three, Rebecca, that, that was one of our church members, she went in the sanctuary and she said Kaylin was standing on top of the baby grand piano, standing on it, right? And, and Rebecca said, you can't be up there. And Kaylin, at three years old, she looked at her and said, you can't tell me what to do. My daddy owns this church, right? <laughs> so don't let your kids go there, right? but I believe we put them in the worship environment. We need to inspire our kids to do things bigger and better than they've ever done before. You know the scripture, and for this morning, I'm applying it to dads in the house in Joshua 1, 9. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid, for the Lord your God is what? With you. The Lord your God is with you. He will go with you wherever you go. I, I just believe society needs fathers to rise up and go to war on behalf of their children. Right? The year 2017 was the first time in the history of America that more than 50% of the children born in our country were born to single mother households. The downfall of the family, the downfall of our society can be directly attributed to the lack of godly fathers in the household. We own this. We should rise up and be the providers and the protectors we, should, we were created to be. We should be aware, but not afraid. All right, let me, let me take a minute. You should be aware. Society wants to kill your kids. Society wants to rob your kids. Society wants to take your kids captive. Online recruitment of our minor sons and daughters into sex trafficking is up 104% in the last 12 months. AI has been loaded with over 5,000 keywords. When your son or daughter, grandson or granddaughter posts, I'm lonely, I'm sad, I might run away, AI starts sending them affirming messages. You're beautiful, you're powerful, you're important. And the first time that kid responds to that, a human picks up that conversation. They're trying to get our kids. You need to be aware. But the thing is, even though we're aware and we understand the darkness of the world in which we live, we don't have to be afraid because the Lord God Almighty is going with us. And if we will rise up and go to war, he will go to war on our behalf. 
I'm telling you right now, I'm not giving my sons and daughters, I'm not giving my grandsons and granddaughters over to the hand of the enemy. If he wants to come in my house, he better be armed to the teeth because when he walks in the door, we are going to war. Stand up, Zay. Stand up right quickly just for a minute. This is Zay, Xavier Clemens. You can sit back down. I met Zay when he was 10 years old. His father never knew his father, abandoned him. Stepfather was an abusive alcoholic. I met Zay when he was 10 years old. We pulled up in an old, ruggedy, ugly school bus in this little uh, 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 run-down apartment complex in the hood in Atlanta, and Zay and a bunch of other kids were playing football, and we walked out and said, hey, we got some food over here, and we got some games over here. Y'all want to go over to my church for a minute? And only Zay said yes, right? We didn't get a parental release for him. We didn't get a permission for him. We did everything thing wrong. Zay just got on the bus and went with us. I became his father. We started having great times together. 24 years later, Zay loves Jesus, works on our campus, does the things he's supposed to do. Every other young man that was on that playground that day, other than Zay, is now dead or in jail. Somebody had to go to war. Somebody had to go to war or Zay was going to be another statistic. And I don't want my kids or my grandkids to be a statistic. And I don't want your kids or your grandkids to be a statistic. But if they're not going to be statistics, we have to go to war because there is a war raging for their souls. And we have to be bigger than the war that is raging. So we inspire our kids. We teach them how to do the right thing. When we inspire them, we become the example and so I've done a few things over the years. I've asked my girls to, be, uh, to be, do hard things for the right reasons a lot of times in their life. We've asked them to excel as the best they can in academics. We've asked them to excel as best they can of daughters of Yahweh. We have two verses of scripture in our family that are sort of life verses. One of those is Matthew 5, 16. Let your light so shine among men and women that they see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Then we just took the word shine out of that verse of scripture and it's been a motto for my daughters all of their life. So when they're leaving for school in the morning when they were younger, Rhonda or I, whoever was there, both of us go shine, shine, no you shine, you shine. We're just telling each other to shine all the time. We give them stuff, we shine all, they're grown women now. And we got a house on campus at City of Refuge. Each one of them has their own bedroom. And Rhonda bought them throw pillows now for their bed that says shine on it. Even at their age, I still want them to shine. We challenge them to shine. You got to do these things. And if you're going to challenge them to shine, you should shine, right? So I'll be 64 years old in a couple months, and, and, I, and I'm trying to stay in relatively good health and good shape because I got these sons-in-laws that are great athletes, and we, I want to try to keep up at least some distance where I can see them, right, where we're together. Grandsons I want to roll on, uh, and granddaughters I want to roll on the ground. We're trying to stay in shape. I try to do things to motivate. My girls ran cross-country track, played soccer, basketball, so we've had a lot of sports. So I've tried to do a couple things along the way to inspire them, and sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't. But even when it doesn't work out, I think it brings inspiration. When the girls were in elementary school, Cass and Kelsey, the oldest, one of their teachers was going on a mission trip and the organization she was with was sponsoring a half marathon to raise money to help cover the cost of the mission trip. So I decided to run in this half marathon, started training for it and everything was fine. The problem was the half marathon was in Denver, Colorado and I'm training in Atlanta, Georgia. And I don't know if you know it or not, but they don't have any oxygen in Denver, Colorado. It's just gone. And so I train, I get on a plane on a Friday afternoon, I fly to Denver, spend the night, six o'clock the next morning, I get on the bus, go to the start line, seven o'clock, the race starts, and I start running a half marathon with no oxygen. And about four miles in, I realize I'm gonna die. It's just, it's not a matter of if, it's just a matter of when. I'm going to die. I'm wondering how they're going to get word back to Rhonda and my girls, right? Fly me home. What are they going to do? So then I start making a plan about the death moment, right? I mean, you need to plan ahead for this stuff, right? So I'm running and I start figure, trying to figure out. So I, I said, when I know I'm going down, what I want to try to do is sort of go down on my side and roll on my back. I don't want to fall on my face because when I'm in the coffin, I still want to look relatively good. I don't want to mess my face up. Right? 
So I'm struggling through it about mile nine. I know I'm completely dehydrated because I've stopped sweating. My hands and feet are swelling and my nose is bleeding, right? And I'm like, well, I just got to keep going now because I told my girls I'm going to run a half marathon to raise money for missions. I didn't know part of the missions might be to raise money to fly me home in a box, but I'm going to keep going. And because it's a Christian event, they got Christian music playing all along the race course, and they're cheering you on. I get to mile 10, and there's a water station, and I stumble over. I get some water, and this little lady, she's probably 75 years old, sweet as she can be. She looks at me, and she goes, Jesus is with you. <laughs> and I looked at her, and I said, you think he wants to run a while? <laughs> I stumbled through the finish line, got on a bus, went back to the hotel, took a shower, went to the airport, got on a plane back that afternoon. About halfway between Denver and Atlanta, at 35,000 feet on a Delta airplane, a, a cramp started at my neck and went all the way down to my little toe. I was laying in the center aisle of an airplane going, ah! <laughs> but I came home and my kids went, how'd you do? I said, I killed it. Smoked it. You should have seen me running this half marathon, right? And I inspired him. I said, go outside and run right now, right? <laughs> you, you, we got to do things to inspire our kids. Five years ago, this past April, I decided to get in a fight. And, uh, <laughs> and it was at this point in the early service that we had to stop for a while because a man had a nervous breakdown over here. So anyway, <laughs> he was laughing. I, I decided to fight in a thing called brawl for a cause, Right? So it's where people that have never fought before boxed, boxed somebody else to raise money for a cause. And so they came to me, I was 58 years old. They said, hey, we think if you fight because of your reputation, people know you in the city, we can raise more money to fight sex trafficking. I'm like, I'm in, right? So I decided to fight. So I trained for a while. You're supposed to fight somebody within three years of you and a certain number of pounds. Surprisingly enough, they couldn't find anybody else over 55 that wanted to fight, right? So they came back, they said, we got a 48-year-old that will fight you. I go, fine, I'll fight the kid, right? So we get in, he's a big old, and I come in, I'm like, oh, look at him. So anyway, <laughs> we, we get in the ring, I have great success right off the bat, knock him down twice in the first round. I'm like, ah, right? Then I lower my guard, second round, he catches me with a left hook right there. I spin sideways, my left foot rolls, and I break my foot. Who breaks their foot in a boxing match? It's the weirdest thing. So I break my foot, right? I finish the round. I go over, come back out, second round. I can't move. I literally can't move, right? So we're just standing there. He's beating me around the head, right? There's this scientific study that says when you think you've exhausted 100% of your physical ability, you've actually only used 40% of your capacity. So you still have 60% left when you think you're finished. I thought I was finished. Rhonda's heard me talk about that study. She's standing at ringside. I've got a broken foot getting pummeled in the head, and she's going, you still got 60%, baby. <laughs> Finally, the fight official walks over and looks at me and goes, I got to stop the fight. You can't move. I said, you can't stop the fight. He goes, you got to, I got to, he stops the fight. So I lose, right? I hate losing. I lose. I don't go to the hospital that night because I'm mad. That's smart. You know, I mean, listen, I make a lot of intelligent decisions, right? I knew my foot was hurt, but anyway, I didn't go to the hospital. Next morning, I put on a boot that one of my sons-in-law had. I put on a boot. I walk in the sanctuary, right? All my girls are there. The women from House of Cherith, the anti-trafficking recovery program that we supported there, and they've watched the live stream the night before. So they've watched me fight on their behalf, and I lost. But they didn't see the fact I lost. What they saw was I fought on their behalf. And so when I walked up on stage to preach that Sunday morning, all the women from House of Cherith and my girls stood up and gave me a standing ovation for losing. But in my loss, I inspired. Inspiring our kids will sometimes cost us 
but it will give them inspiration to try something they might not have tried before. Now, I'm not going to tell you that every single time we instruct and instill and inspire that something good's going to happen, but I will tell you every now and then something really cool happens. I have no idea if I've shared this story here, but, but when uh, Cassie was in fifth grade, she ran cross country for her middle school because they didn't have enough runners for sixth through eighth grade, and so she ran, and turns out she was the fastest one on the team. So she qualified for the state middle school championship in the 1600 meter run, right? And so we get to the state championship and I'm working the start finish line. One of the volunteers, Rhonda was pregnant with Carly. She's sitting in the football stands across the field from the track. Cassie walks out. All other seven qualifiers for the state championship are eighth graders. And here's one little fifth grader beside her. So there's seven eighth graders lined up and this little squirt's over here and she's like, ha, ah. and she comes over to me and she goes, ha, ha, and I said, you'll be okay and she threw up. So I, I listen, <laughs> she went in the woods how many times? Three, four times, threw up before the race, right? The fastest girls, if you know track, are in the middle lanes, four and five when you start. Cassie's in lane eight, so she's the slowest qualifier of the eight. But I'm like, well, it's just cool. You're fifth grade, you shouldn't even be here. You're here, just have a good time. And so after the first 400 meters, she was in seventh place. And I'm like, we're not going to get last. So as she went by, I said, hey, way to go. After 800 meters, they came around and she had moved up to fourth place. I'm like, oh, what's going on? I went, run a little faster. <laughs> right? After 1,200 meters, they come around. The child has moved up to second place. And as they went by, I said, you better run right now. The girl in first place was about 70 meters ahead of her. They start down the back straight away on the other side of the field, and I see Rhonda stand up. And I remember that one of our other life verses is Daniel chapter 6 and verse number 3 that says Daniel had a more excellent spirit than all of the young men in the land. And we tell our girls over and over, you have the spirit of Daniel, you have the spirit of excellence. Rhonda stood up. Her mom was with her. The other girls, Rhonda stood up, and I heard Rhonda go, Cassie! You have the spirit of Daniel. And I could see people going, I thought his name was Bruce. <laughs> you have the spirit of excellence, Cassie. You have the spirit of Daniel. They come around the last turn. Cassie's moved up to about 30 meters behind. They come down the last straightaway with about 10 meters to go. Cassie runs by this little girl, wins the race because she's this little squirt. Whole place goes crazy. I'm losing my mind. Rhonda's losing her mind. Cassie runs out to the end, turns around, walks back to me real slowly, catches her breath, looks up at me and said, did you hear mama? <laughs> I'm like, darling, everybody heard mama. Some of your sons and daughters are running away right now. They're running away from love and grace and peace and mercy. They're running away from the cross. They're running away from what you instructed, instilled, and inspired them. And I want you to know this morning that the enemy would love for you to move to a place of doubt and fear and sadness. But here's what I believe. I believe the God of all creation is standing up and calling your son and daughter's name right now. I believe the God of all creation has invited Jesus and the Holy Spirit to stand up with him. I believe the God of all creation has invited Jesus and the Holy Spirit and all of heaven to stand up. And whatever your son or daughter's name is, the God of all creation has an army of warriors standing up going, hey, John, hey, Sally, hey, 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 it's time to turn around and go home. I know you don't think you can outrun fear. I know you don't think you can outrun addiction. I know you don't think you can outrun suicidal ideation. I know you don't think you can outrun perversion. But I'm telling you this morning, I believe God is saying to your sons and daughters, you will win this race. You will win this race. <laughs> Father, for your grace and your mercy, for your justice and your peace that you've given to me when I was running the wrong way and you shouted my name and I turned around, 
when I'd cut a hole in in the wall of my life, when I'd climbed out of your grace, when I'd done the things that were inappropriate and unethical and caused you, I know, your heart to break, you still stepped, you still kept standing up, shouting my name and inviting me back. And this morning, I just believe that you are depositing a new seed of faith, a new seed of hope, a new seed of optimism in the hearts of fathers and mothers in this room. And I believe right now there's a son or a daughter that is turning around and they're headed back home where they're supposed to be. So today we proclaim and prophesy sons and daughters are coming home and fathers and mothers will rejoice together because that which was lost has now been found. In Jesus' name, I declare a spirit spirit of instructing, instilling, and inspiring in this household. And it is to you that we will give the honor, the glory, the praise, and the thanksgiving. And everybody said together, amen. Hallelujah.